19th, Tuesday the 19th. I'm on your left. All set? Good evening and welcome to the Norfolk Board of Selectmen's meeting of Tuesday, May 19th. Uh, my name is Jim Lehan to my left and welcome back, Mr. Thank you. Berkeley. Our Happy to be back. Recently re-elected selectman uh, is joining us this evening. Uh, Mr. Palumbo is traveling, unfortunately, and is unable to attend tonight. I want to advise everyone that this meeting is being both audio and videotaped. Uh, we have, we're starting early this evening at 6.30 and the main purpose for this meeting is to introduce to folks a project that we've been working on for some time and just briefly as a way of background some of you may remember that uh, a year ago at town meeting a gentleman by the name of George Vallone made a brief presentation concerning a potential project at the old Southwood Hospital site. Uh, Mr. Vallone approached us uh, well over a year ago about the opportunity that um, we might foresee for that, for that land and as you can imagine, where it's such a large piece of property and brings such unique features, not to mention two brownfields associated with it, and it's owned by the Archdiocese, uh, we felt that it was necessary to bring a group of folks together uh, to work with Mr. Vallone to try and address some of the issues and concerns that a project of this magnitude would present to the community. So I, I want to, and I know George is going to introduce that group, but on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, I want to thank these folks for having participated in this. Uh, we have met probably I'm going to guess about a dozen times over the last year. Uh, the attendance has been darn near 100%. Um, we've worked through a lot of issues. There are still some open issues that we need to work through and some closure, but we're at the point where we want to start to begin to present this to the community because it is a very unique opportunity. Uh, Southwood is a large parcel um, owned, as I mentioned, by the Archdiocese. Mr. Vallone has a purchase and sale or uh, an agreement in place for this property, but it is pending some changes to zoning that would be required by a town meeting vote. And so we have been working through some of the concerns as it relates to the size of the project, some of the financial considerations, whether it is a good or bad financial arrangement for the town, and some of the issues associated with our infrastructure, such as schools, public safety, police, fire, et cetera. And uh, again, I just want to say thank you to all the members of this group because uh, it's been a challenge. Uh, it's been new turf for all of us. Um, and we're grateful for all the effort that you folks have put in. I also want to thank George for having stuck, Absolutely. stayed with us and worked through those concerns. And I think we're beginning to uh, formulate some agreement around how this might really be a very good opportunity for Norfolk. So again, the purpose this evening is informational. It's to uh, get this out on the air. There is a meeting that will be held on Thursday evening at the middle school at 7 o'clock. I encourage everyone that has the opportunity to attend. Uh, this is a significant <coughs> project. You know, give you an opportunity to ask questions and to really get into the um, project itself. And I know uh, we're anxious to have that opportunity. So please, if you can, attend. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to George, who's going to give us an overview of the project. Okay. So um, I have to turn my back on somebody. So I'm thinking I'm going to turn free. my back on you guys. Fine. Good decision. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is George Vallone. And, uh, I've George, we're going to go out here so we can watch as oh, well. Excellent. Uh, I've been a developer now for 35 years. Uh, my partner, Danny Gans, uh, and I met at uh, Gettysburg College in the 70s, and we became partners in the late 70s, and we've been partners now for over 35 years. Um, we have a uh, expertise at working on redevelopment of brownfield sites, and we've done some high-profile projects where there was a lot of community involvement back in New Jersey. Our, of our office is in Jersey, by the way. It's the Hoboken Brownstone Company. We started in Hoboken, New Jersey, 1979. Uh, we're currently uh, in the next community over, Jersey City, uh, where we have uh, uh, some several rather large projects we're working on right there. Um, we have been uh, very blessed with having some very successful projects, um, all as a result of working with community groups like yourself. Uh, we won a National Brownfields Award from the Environmental Protection Agency, what they call their Phoenix Award. We won a uh, very prestigious award from New Jersey Future, which is a community, statewide community action group in New Jersey as the number one mixed-use development uh, in 2010. We've won uh, awards from the uh, trades unions. We had the best brick building. Uh, the Masons uh, Union gave us an award for that. And uh, we sort of pride ourselves with creating win-win uh, arrangements with uh, a win in with the community, a win with the development site, the owner of the development site, in this case, the Archdiocese of Boston, um, and a win for our, our capital providers. Um, 
I met this site, I was introduced to this site by an environmental company that has an environmental office in Rentham. Uh, their headquarters is in New Jersey, a company called Sovereign Environmental Services. And uh, I met Tom Labasso, who's their business development manager, at the National Brownfields Conference in 2006, where I was giving a presentation on working with consultants and working with uh, property owners. And he introduced me to the property. Um, primarily because he wanted to end up getting the environmental work, which he's going to get uh, as a result of the introduction to the property. If the project does go forward and we get to the point where we do the remediation work, his company is going to perform that work for us. They have licensed site professionals uh, on staff, I think three licensed professionals on their staff over in Rentham. Um, so Tom introduced me to the property. I started negotiating the, the contract with, with Caritas who was the owner of the property, uh, as well as seven other hospitals, uh, six besides the Southwood Hospital site. And I spent two years negotiating with the Caritas folks, and then they sold the property to a hedge fund called Cerberus. Uh, they sold the six operating units. They did not sell the Southwood property, because that was closed, and Cerberus only wanted operating companies. So the uh, Southwood Hospital site ownership was transferred back to the parent organization, which is the Archdiocese of Boston, and I then started all over again. Uh, it took about two more years uh, to negotiate a contract with the uh, Archdiocese of Boston. Their primary concern, as you can imagine, was the environmental liability on the property. So as part of our contract, we've agreed to assume all those environmental liabilities. The contract is subject to getting zoning approval, because obviously without zoning approval, you can't do anything with it and then environmental approvals, uh, and then permitting for uh, utilities, water and sewer. So we uh, signed the contract in April of 2014. Uh, one month later, I approached uh, the town, um, spoke to Jack Hathaway first, and suggested to him that I wanted to have an opportunity to talk to the town about the project and suggest a community uh, advisory committee be formed. Um, Jack introduced me to Jim. And Jim would gave me a, a five-minute speaking slot at the May 2014 town meeting where I introduced myself, introduced, my, introduced the property, and introduced my intention to try to redevelop the property. And uh, at that point, asked for uh, a sit volunteers for a citizen's advisory committee to be formed so that we could work through a site plan that would be um, a win for everybody. Um, Jim volunteered to be on the committee. Jim's been here for 39 years. He's been on the school committees. He's been on the board of selectmen for 11 years. Uh, Tom Gilbert uh, also volunteered. He's been here for 43 years. He's chairman of the board of health. Uh, Joyce Terrio uh, is a resident for 31 years and she's been in volunteer and recreation. She's a former select person, advisory committee member, uh, active community person. Uh, Walter Br uh, Br Bryan uh, also has lived in the town a long time, since 68. He's been on the school committee. He's a member of the master plan committee, the economic development committee, a uh, past person uh, working on that. He's been on the planning board, uh, and he's also um, a uh, retired, so he's got some time to spend with us, <laughs> which he has done. Uh, Aaron Hunt, an at-large member, resident. John Waddle, uh, Weddle Weddleton, who's chairman of your CONCOM committee, conservation committee. He's been very active on it. Member of the planning board. Peter Diamond, another member of the, of the town and, uh, and a committee member. Uh, Bob Bullock, your building inspector, has been involved with the committee. And uh, of course, Ray Goff, who's your town planner, has been involved in it. So I, I want to echo uh, Jim's uh, words at the beginning of the meeting that, uh, and Peter. So, oh, Chris, I'm sorry. Chris, why aren't you on there? My apologies. Also, <laughs> Chris Weeder's on there. And, uh, and he's also a resident. And zoning board. Jeez, I don't know how I forgot you. My apologies. I, I thought I had everybody on there. <laughs> I have so far. Um, so, uh, so anyway, it's been a great committee. We have met um, almost every other month now for about a, about a year. And, uh, and we have just, uh, at last um, Tuesday night's meeting, um, we came to agreement on, on the development plan that I'm going to present to you uh, as being uh, as beneficial and worthy of moving out to the community uh, process now, community outreach process. This is the first of three events, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Uh, we're going to do a presentation about the plan tonight. Tomorrow we're going to film on local KB cable TV channel, the same uh, presentation you're going to get tonight. And then uh, Thursday night at the middle school at uh, 7 o'clock. Um, so um, you'll get a chance to, uh, to see it a couple of times. And then our hope is that by 
the November town meeting. This will be ready. The warrant will be prepared and submitted and reviewed by the different committees and the different folks that have to go over it and approve it, and it will be ready for a vote by the town uh, on a uh, date in uh, November. So I'd like to uh, go ahead now and talk about the what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the plan itself and describe the plan. Um, it's over there, and it's also on the board over here. We're going to talk about what the plan is, consists of. We're going to talk about the uh, fiscal impacts, which we've analyzed, and there's a report that there'll be copies of people can take, and uh, then we're going to talk about the development agreement, which is going to be the contract between the developer, me, and the town, uh, and spells out a number of particulars. Uh, and then we'll talk, and then we'll do uh, Q and A. Hopefully, we'll have time to do Q and A at the end of that. Um, so, the uh, first part of all that is the actual plan itself, and um, what you can see on the screen is the uh, proposed site plan for the property. It has uh, four elements. It has uh, 220 townhouses, which is the left side of the, of the drawing, and those, are, uh, those will be age-restricted townhouses. Uh, then my computer just uh, decided to take a break. There we go. And then the next piece over is uh, two 75-unit apartment buildings, 50% one bedrooms, 50% two bedrooms, for a total of 150 market rate apartments. <coughs> Uh, the next piece over going to the right is an assisted living complex, and that will have 120 uh, independent living uh, units, uh, 30 um, higher level of care and uh, memory care and dementia and hospice. It's for a total of 180 uh, altogether uh, units. And then the last piece to the very right is uh, retail, 16,000 square feet of retail on grade, and the second floor, which will have 16,000 feet of office space. Uh, approximately 40 acres of the property is designated wetlands. We went through the Conservation Commission and uh, submitted all the, uh, the tests and the documents and the property was uh, flagged and marked and our consultant agreed with your consultant and they came up with a delineation which was approved. So that whole piece to the right is all going to be restricted area um, designated as wetlands. The piece in the middle of the top, which is sort of a light green uh, oval type shaped, that's where we're probably going to be putting a wastewater treatment facility. This project will require 88,000 gallons a day of water and will create 88,000 gallons a day of, uh, of effluent waste, which will be treated on site. Uh, we're doing uh, hydrogeological testing in that area right now, and our hope is that the area can absorb that um, well before the... Uh, meeting in, in November, there'll be the results of those tests will verify that this plan is viable in terms of wa wastewater treatment. So that's the plan. Uh, again, just to summarize, 220 age-restricted townhomes, 75, uh, 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 150 luxury apartments, 120 uh, active independent uh, assisted living, and 60 uh, not independent living, memory care, dementia, and hospice units. So a total of 100 and 80 uh, rooms altogether. 16,000 foot of retail, 16,000 foot of office. So, um, the next part I want to talk about is the affordable component. The house, uh, this project has an affordable component by taking the assisted living facility and by making 120 of the 180 units independent living, which means they have a kitchen and a bathroom. Uh, they qualify, and then by taking 25% of those 120 independent living units and making them available at affordable uh, rates, the entire 120 units counts towards the town's affordable housing requirement. So this will be a net gain for the town uh, in terms of meeting their um, affordable housing uh, quota. This will move them, I believe this moves you from about 4% where you are now to about 7%, if I remember the numbers correctly, of your, of your quota, which is 10%. Um, so some significant progress on that score. Um, for the next part of the development, I want to talk about the fiscal uh, impact analysis, which we did, and what the results of that is, are. And um, what we did was we looked at what the, uh, assuming that these are built and sold at what we project their market values will be, we created a assessed valuation for the project, which is about $170 million. 
We then applied the current tax rate to it, and, uh, and we divided that by the number of people, and we came up with a revenue per, uh, cost per person, revenue for, per person, and we analyzed the budget as it is today without the development and as it would be with the development as it phases in over 10 years. We looked at the impact on the town budget, and at full build out, there would be an annual net surplus of about two to two and a half million dollars. Um, we looked at the impact on the school budget. This, pr this project is projected because of the apartments to put anywhere from 21 to 68 new students into the school system. So we analyzed the impact on the school budget. And again, there would be a surplus of approximately one to one and a half million dollars. Uh, we looked at the impact on the municipal budget, and the impact there is a surplus of approximately $1 million. Uh, it generates about $1.4 million of additional revenue and about $400,000 of additional cost. Um, in the municipal budget, we, we took the public safety portion of the budget and didn't do that on a per capita basis. We did that based on requests by the town for an additional ambulance and additional staffing for emergency services. So that's an actual number, not a, not a proportional number. Um, so the bottom line of all this is that property taxes are projected to go down. Uh, the rate of growth right now is about 4.9% annually. Uh, without the project, with the project, that slows down to 3.2% annually. Uh, so over the 10 years of the development, that would equate to about $12,000 a year of savings for the average property owner over 10 years and then after full build out in 10 years about $2,100 a year um, average savings. <clears throat> I just want to quickly flip to that study. I meant to have that up here while we were doing that. <clears throat> So this is the study. Um, we looked at school enrollment, the budget. There's copies of this available for everybody, too. Um, we looked at the school budget, the town budget. We looked at enrollment. As you can see, the enrollment in the <coughs> Uh, King Phillip School is slightly going down. The Norfolk Public Stills is going down rather dramatically in population projection. These are all gotten off the, off of your, uh, your school's websites. We talked about the Rentham Schools, the Plainfield Schools, which are feeders into the high school. They're also going down. So it looks as though over the future the high school will begin to trail down. Um, we looked at the tax rate, which has been averaging 4.5 percent per year. Uh, given the low population, the average tax bill would be down 16 percent uh, in 10 years at full build out, approximately $2,100 a year at the low population, and just a little bit more if it's the high population of students. The variable here is the number of students that are going to be generated. Um, <clears throat> sort of the summary of the whole thing, and I think what most people care about is, you know, how is this going to affect my property tax bill? And so the top graph would be the average property tax bill without the development, $13,100. And with the development and that slowed rate of growth, uh, approximately uh, $10,900, so about $2,000, $2,100 a year of savings on your average property tax bill. Um, that's pretty much the bottom line of the study. There's a lot of details at how those numbers were generated, but it all leads to um, this projection right here as to how it would affect, you know, once you talk about what happens to the municipal budget, what happens to the school budget, how does that all domino into everybody's tax bill, which is how we pay for all this stuff, this is what we think the results will be. We think the results will be a, a pretty dramatic slowdown in the increase in taxes, and at full build out, your bill would be something like $2,100 a year less than what it would be without the development. <clears throat> so the last part of the presentation would be the developer agreement. Um, developer agreement is a contract between a developer and a town. Uh, this developer agreement is being uh, written by the town. Um, and so it's, um, 
they have to agree with it or they wouldn't have wrote it this way. Uh, we've gone through all these items. I'll touch on them briefly. Um, it's in next to final form. We, we had a, uh, a lively discussion about this at our meeting last Monday night, and there was a bunch of changes we agreed to, which I'll go over. And then this is going to be finalized, um, I believe by tomorrow, I think this is going to be finalized, Ray was telling me. And, uh, and then we'll be pretty much ready to move that in front of the uh, selectmen at one of the upcoming meetings to get approval for that, because this has to be approved and signed by uh, uh, one of the selectmen and on behalf of the town and me on behalf of the developer. So the issues we talked about were, we talked about the zoning, that this is going to require creation of a town overlay district, which is the reason for the town vote in uh, November. Uh, we talked about water. Uh, the town is going to provide water for the property. We are going to make a million dollar contribution uh, to the next municipal well. The town's in the process right now of sourcing a new municipal well to add to their supply. Uh, we're going to make a contribution to that. We talked about sewage disposal. I mentioned that that's going to be uh, on site, a wastewater treatment plant, so we'll handle our own sewage on site. Uh, we talked about phasing. There's going to be a phasing plan where we're going to be sure that the affordable component of the project gets completed before all of the market rate parts of the project get completed. There'll be bonding for all the streets and improvements so that there'll be a financial surety that'll guarantee that all that work gets complete. Uh, the affordable housing component, I mentioned that already. You're going to get 100, the town's going to get 120 units of uh, affordable credits towards its affordable housing obligation. Uh, we talked about traffic impacts. We're going to be doing traffic studies, and we're going to take care of whatever the uh, traffic engineers agree needs to be done on Route 1A and possibly on Valley Street. We're going to agree with that. Uh, there's going to be, um, we talked about the fiscal impacts. We talked about the need for site plan approval. So once the actual overlay district gets approved, if it does get approved at the November town meeting, then there'll be a full site plan application and we'll go through the normal process of getting the, uh, uh, the site work and the engineering work and all of that reviewed and approved by the town. Um, it's going to be a binding agreement. It's a contract. It's going to be signed by both parties and, uh, and it'll also have an operating and maintenance plan that'll make sure that the property will be uh, maintained, the infrastructure, the roads, the improvements will all be maintained uh, by the developer of the property. Just want to double check that we got everything. I think that's pretty much all of it. And this will be, you know, once this is completed and, and signed by me and being uh, reviewed by the uh, selectmen and uh, any other folks that need to review this, I'm sure this will be available. Um, all the information being presented, the site plan, the fiscal impact analysis, uh, the developer agreement uh, in, uh, in, in due course, um, as I understand it, is all going to be posted on the town website so that it can be downloaded by the community. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, I'm going to be uh, making the same presentation on your local cable TV uh, channel uh, tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and so that'll start running throughout the summer. I'm not sure exactly what the frequency of that is, but uh, it'll be running so that as we move through the summer and uh, the other steps that need to be done, there's committees that need to review it, a warrant has to be prepared and reviewed, and it all has to be queued up for this November meeting, um, there'll be plenty of information that uh, people can see, uh, replays of what you're seeing tonight, and, um, and then all the documents that we've been referring to and the pictures and the maps and the studies will all be available for anybody to take uh, and download and, and review and, um, and come back with any questions, if there are any. So that completes uh, my presentation, and uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions or comments. It's uh, almost 7 o'clock, so we have some time. I think your, your planning board meeting starts at 7.30? 7.30. So we have some time for questions and answers if anybody would like to uh, say anything. I'm just going to pass you the mic because I understand it. If you don't talk into this, they don't hear it. Hi, George. Uh, <clears throat> during your presentation, you mentioned uh, that uh, taxes would go down. I think what you later said was that the rate of increase of taxes would be held down, which is more correct. So I just recommend that you think about that the next time you make the presentation on TV and not say that the taxes are going down. It's the rate of increase that will be held down. You're right. Thank you. Appreciate that. 
Thanks, George. Uh, just, I think it would be helpful also to clarify, uh, it would be more specific on the financial arrangement. Uh, you, okay. You've agreed to give the town $1 million upon the closing of the property. Right. You've also agreed to give us additional payments on the issuance of each of the building permits for the rest Correct. of the project. Yep. The total being the cost of a well plus about $800,000 for public safety, not to exceed $3 million in terms of the cost of the well. So I think yes. that would be helpful to add that. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's actually... Um, up to three million for the well and and eight hundred thousand for the uh, public safety improvements. So three point eight million dollars max. Um, the the three million dollars for the well is a number that was arrived at because we're not sure if there's going to be treatment needed for the well. So a well itself costs one point five million. If it needs treatment to get the quality of the water up to drinking standards, then that could be another one point five million. So we've we've capped the well expense at three million. Um, the uh, the extra ambulance and the extra personnel that's eight hundred thousand. So um, I I'm very glad you brought that up, Jim. So it's a million dollars at the closing on the property, and then the balance of that three point of up to three point eight million dollars payable as building permits are drawn down. So obviously, if those payments aren't made, building permits won't be issued, and we can't do anything without building permits. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, George. Um, on Thursday night, will you be going into greater detail about hazardous cleanup? Um, I can. I could talk about it a little bit now, and, and I could talk about it more then, if I you'd like. I found in just a little bit of um, casual, observational uh, studies that I've done in my own neighborhood that toxic waste as it's always called comes up first mm -hmm. some people use terms that are a little stronger um, so I think there's a misperception as to how bad it is or how it will be t addressed and taken care of and then uh, the second concern is traffic mm -hmm. down in that area so on Thursday night your presentation, uh, you may have already explained this. Will it be in, in much greater detail about the agreement or? Well, let me, let me talk about both of those issues. Okay. And then you can tell me if you think that you need more and we'll drill down deeper. Um, let's talk about the environmental issues first. There are essentially three areas of concern on the property. Uh, one is the hospital itself. It was built a long time ago. They used asbestos for insulation. There were mercury, halide lamps, and, and probably some other things. The hospital is going to be completely demolished. So the demolition contractor is going to have to do a hazardous cleanup within the hospital prior to demolition because you can't throw that stuff out into a landfill. It has to be taken care of uh, special. So all the issues within the hospital buildings will be remediated in the process of doing demolition. The other two issues are there was an oil spill a while ago um, on the, I think it's the northeast corner of the hospital in the back of the building. There was an oil spill. They were, de they were delivering um, heating oil, and it spilled, and it went into the ground. And um, over time, heating oil breaks down, and it starts to degrade, and, um, and we're not sure how much is still there. So what we do know is that it was there. And we also know that recently your Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection issued new regulations regarding oil spills of this nature. And the new regulations are that if you put wells around the spill area and those wells can determine that that oil is either gone or not going anywhere, it's contained within various levels of the ground, that you are allowed to leave it in place because over time it's going to disappear. Um, we're not sure what the degree of any of that is because only a few of those wells are in place right now by prior developers that came in and did some limited site investigation. So we have limited information. When we do get to do the full site investigation, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter million dollars, we'll know exactly what's down there and is it degrading and is it moving. So we're going to deal with that based on all the regulations that are required onto how you deal with that. The third area of concern is the landfill. And the landfill was uh, a dump. 
it was, you know, I mean, 100 years ago, uh, they didn't have garbage pickup, so everybody picked a little spot on their property, and that's where they dumped everything. And the hospital did that. And so there's um, uh, rumors out there that radioactive waste was dumped there and bio waste because, I, you know, they were a cancer treatment facility for a long time. So there's a lot of rumors about what might be in that landfill. And there was limited testing. Um, what was done was groundwater monitoring wells were installed all around the landfill by, uh, by the Arch, well, by Caritas before the Archdiocese took it back. Those groundwater monitoring results are indicating that there is no radioactivity coming out of that. There is no toxic chemicals coming out of that. There is nothing coming out of that that's impacting the groundwater around the site and under the site. So the question is, what is there? in that landfill and we don't know but part of the site investigation that's going to occur if the town approves the zoning plan and we move to the next step is going to be to open that landfill up and dig down some test pits and do some more tests boring tests and test pits and we're going to figure out what's in there um, if what's in there is just benign we may just cap it and leave it there um, anything other than that has to be removed. If it, you know, if the law is you got to remove it, it's going to be removed. It's going to be sent to a landfill uh, that's uh, licensed to receive those types of things. So, um, so we're going to deal with it. We're going to investigate it first, and then we're going to deal with it based on all the rules and regulations. Uh, we have limited information right now, but we're going to, you know, the next stage of the deal with the archdiocese was step one was got to have zoning approval. Step two is got to have environmental investigation and a satisfactory remedial action work plan cost. Um, step three is the wastewater treatment permitting process and then we close and then the work begins. So it's a step-by-step -step process, a large project like this. You have to eliminate risk. There's, there's a sequence that you want to eliminate risk in. That's the most efficient way to do a deal like this. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to go through it all. Great. That's an excellent explanation. Thank you. Um, and just one small thing. Sure. A few people have asked me if the main entrance would remain intact. And you and I talked about that, that it was suggested um, that the Pondville Correctional entrance and the Pondville Hospital, Pondville Estates entrance, yep. and have you been able to observe that they're much closer to each other than was thought? Uh, they are close to each other. There's actually two entrances. I would, uh, yeah. There's actually two entrances to the property. Um, as currently, uh, to the to the townhouse portion, there, there's these two entrances right here, and, and so I the one on the right would be the existing one, correct? This one is close to the existing curb cut. Okay. Yeah. And I actually think that the one up here is closer to the entrance to the prison. Okay. Um, so we're going to have a uh, traffic study done, and that's going to make recommendations. Right now, about 8,000 cars a day use Route One A. That was based on a traffic study that was done by a prior developer that was looking at the property. We got a copy of that. Um, and it, it may have changed a little bit because it was close to 10 years ago, but I, I don't think it changed that much. Uh, but we're going to do our own traffic study, and we're going to end up coming back and uh, adjusting the plan uh, based on whether or not there's going to be a need for a traffic light uh, or uh, slowdown lanes as you approach where you have to turn in. They may need an additional lane, you know, whatever the traffic engineers decide. Additionally, we've heard from... Uh, folks like you and um, the other lady that was here, Nancy what's her name? Nancy, Nancy. Nancy was here uh, at the last meeting, and she expressed concerns about Valley Street. So um, there's some discussion that maybe Valley Street ought to change, uh, either become one way, one way west, one way east, but some change that would help the traffic situation on Route 1A. So what we agreed to do was when our traffic engineers do the traffic study for our property and its impacts on 1A, we're going to have them look at Valley Street and make recommendations about what would be a better way for Valley Street to run if, if it should change directions or become one direction one way or the other. So we're going to incorporate that into our overall traffic study and then we'll come back to the town. Uh, I mean, it's a town road. I can't say, you know, I can't just say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, but I can say, this is what our traffic engineers suggest you do, and then the town can decide if that's something they want to do. So that's, that's traffic. 
can I, I one more thing I think it would be helpful for you to clarify and I'm going to turn it over to Tom which is clarification on our consultant working with the Board of Health yeah thanks Jim the uh, the conversation around who's going to be overseeing the environmental assessment work yes um, you mentioned LSP is going to be hired to be basically a consultant uh, for the project but essentially a person who's going to be selected and contracted by the Board of Health so the person will be answering essentially to the board to the town uh, frankly on your dime um, to uh, essentially take care of the town's interests and making sure that uh, uh, the environmental assessments are accurate and then the remediation process is done appropriately yes um, I'm glad you brought that up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna elaborate on it so the concern that was expressed by the advisory committee was hey the licensed site professional you hire he's gonna be working for you so how do we know he's gonna do as thorough a job as if he was hired by the town and so we thought that a fair compromise would be that the town ought to have its own licensed site remediation professional that they're gonna hire at our expense and he's gonna be involved in two major I mean he's gonna oversee everything but there's really two major things that he's gonna be charged with doing the first is gonna be approving the site investigation so we have to do a site investigation that's gonna have to do with the hospital that's not that big a deal because we know that's all gonna be disposed of but the oil spill and the landfill are gonna be investigated and so the uh, the what we call the SI plan the site investigation plan which is the blueprint of how we're gonna test those two areas of concern is the first thing that a consultant does for a developer or for a town he says okay this is what the problems are and here's how we're going to investigate it we're going to do test pits we're going to do soil borings we're going to do groundwater wells it, it, or a combination of all three and there's going to be a plan called the site investigation plan so your LSP is going to approve that plan so that he makes sure that we're investigating it thoroughly and properly the second part is going to be the remedial action work plan as a result of a site investigation you now know what you have the extent of it um, you've horizontally delineated the issues you have vertically delineated the issues and now it's time to come up with the, re the remedial action work plan which is actually okay what are we gonna do about it how are we gonna fix it and so uh, our LSP will will draft a remedial action work plan your LSP will review that and as long as he's concurred that it's uh, that, I mean there's two objectives when you do brownfield remediation you have to protect the public and you have to protect the environment so as long as your LSP agrees with our LSP that this remedial action work plan that we've developed as a result of the site investigation is protective of human health and the public uh, and the environment then he'll sign off and that'll be the plan that we will uh, use for the remediation of the property thank you for that I'm making notes because these are things I want to make sure I don't forget next time Uh, one further clarification you might want to consider is uh, we had conversations about if the oil was capped because it was deemed to be not moving mm -hmm. that if it was found to be moving in the future 15 years from end of project mm -hmm. that the ownership of the property would be the ones responsible for treating it at that time not necessarily the town right so it, the, the treatment of the hazardous materials it remains with the ownership of the property right so so um, let me go into that more um, so the way a, a re there's two kinds of, of remediation work uh, in the brownfield business one is what they refer to as an unrestricted remedial plan and that means you're cleaning everything up to residential standards there's nothing left if you do an unrestricted cleanup you're done if you do what's referred to as a restricted cleanup then that means you're leaving certain contamination in the ground and there's two ways you deal with that one is what's called an engineering control typically it's a cap that's on the site two foot with a membrane that separates the dirty dirt from the clean dirt or some other engineering control but as an engineering control put in place a and B there's institutional controls which means deed notices that says hey there's an issue over here don't drill a well and drink the water right here where the oil spill was or don't use the groundwater where the landfill was those are called institutional controls when you do a restricted cleanup with institutional controls part of it 
is an operating and maintenance program. There has to be a plan to operate and maintain those engineering controls. So if you have a cap, you have to inspect the cap. In New Jersey, it's every two years. You have to get a permit every two years, and you have to inspect the cap, and you've got to get a certification from a licensed uh, site remediation professional that the cap is fine. Uh, if there are groundwater monitoring, because you're leaving certain things in the groundwater, then you need to have monitoring wells. And those monitoring wells have to be tested. Again, in New Jersey, it's every two years. You have to write a report. The uh, LSP has to say that whatever was down there is either uh, being reduced in concentration or remaining the same and not moving beyond the area where it originally was. He has to certify to that. So when you do a, a common interest ownership type of development, like this will be, there will be a homeowner association for each of the uh, residential components. There will be an umbrella association where the commercial components will be a part of the umbrella master association. Within the budget for the association will be a section called the replacement reserve budget, and that's where the homeowners reserve for certain common improvements, fixing the roads every so many years, fixing the storm systems, and maintaining all the infrastructure. Within that budget, when you have a restricted use cleanup, is the 30 years of monitoring, uh, whatever is required based on your engineering, uh, rem your engineered remedy, uh, the cost of maintaining that for 30 years, in Jersey it's 30 years, I'm sure it's the same here because we actually modeled our program off of the Massachusetts program which was in place first, um, they have to have that in their budget. So every year, everybody, every month, everybody has a little common charge they pay, either a maintenance charge if you want to call it that or a, com a CAM, a common area maintenance charge. The part of that charge goes into that replacement reserve budget, and that becomes the fund that takes care of the ongoing monitoring and operating and maintenance of the engineering controls. So if we do a restricted use cleanup, um, then there will be engineering controls. There will be a budget to maintain those controls over 30 years. And, um, and if it turns out that there's an adverse change in conditions down there, normally there isn't. Normally the you know, nobody's adding to the oil spill and nobody's dumping more stuff in the landfill. So the normal thing you would expect would be a natural attenuation. Things degrade and things break down over time and, and the, and the uh, impacts to the environment actually lessen over time, which is why they let you do engineered controls because they recognize that. So, um, so that's how that will be paid for by the homeowner association uh, for the residential portions and by the umbrella associations, which incorporates the commercial pieces. No further questions? Then I guess we're done. No, wait, another question. Who, who had the mic? Oh, there you go. Is there a phasing sequence for the residential versus the commercial? Yes, there is. Um, the phasing sequence is actually in the impact study. So, the, um, the townhouses are going to be built one-sixth a year, and we predict that will take over six years to build that. 220 townhouses divided by six, 80 units a year. That's a pretty safe estimate from the folks I've talked to about the absorption rate of, of houses of this nature in this market. The assisted living, which includes the memory care and the, and the um, uh, hospice portion, the rental apartments and the office space. Well, actually, we, we carved off the office and, and commercial. Uh, so the assisted living and the rental apartments will be built one-third of each of them uh, in the first uh, three years of the project. So those will be completed first. And that was the whole idea, that that portion, which includes the uh, affordables, uh, gets completed before the townhouses get complete. <laughs> And what's the sequence for the office and retail? Well, we just, the committee and I decided that we weren't going to sequence the office and the retail because I really am not sure about what the demand for that is. So we decided that that will be sort of its own phase. If we can get a retailer right away, we'll build it right away. Um, if we get an office user, we'll throw the second floor on right away. Uh, but as of right now, we're not 100% sure about the retail and the office, so we decided not to put that a phasing requirement on that portion.
Any other questions? Okay, so we finished 10 minutes early. Thank you very much. Thank you, George.